there can be no greater service to humanity than a timely prediction of a major socio-political crisis like a pandemic or world war. Astrology is flourishing, and yet very few astrologers predicted the global events of 2020. Did astrology miss a great opportunity here? In this video, I talk to Dr. Nicholas Campion about the history of astrology prediction with a special focus on the predictive techniques of the French astrologer André Barbeau. If you're curious about why astrology failed to predict the 2020 pandemic, then keep watching. Our guest, Dr. Nicholas Campion, is a historian of astrology and cultural astronomy with an academic career at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. Nick is the author of 30 books. His latest book, The Harmony Debates, was published last year in October 2020. What stands out in history as the most significant prediction made by an astrologer? The uh, amazing prediction in 2011 by the French astrologer André Barbeau of the pandemic of 2020. Uh, 20, uh, to 2021. There's been other very interesting predictions made by astrologers, but this pandemic is the first uh, truly global event, probably for uh, many thousands of years, the first event to preoccupy the entire globe. Tell us more about André Barbeau, the value of his work, and the origins of the cyclical index he used in his predictions. André Barbeau was uh, born in 1920. One died in 2019. He was a uh, self-taught astrologer, the cyclical index uh, that uh, Barbo used. He didn't originate it, but it was developed after the Second World War in a response by astrologers to the fact that uh, most astrologers had completely failed to predict the war. In fact, not only they failed to predict it, there were some high profile predictions that would, there would be no war. So there was a number of astrologers who looked at astrology and said, well, if it can't predict something so fundamental, there must be something wrong. And so they turned back to earlier methodologies and uh, came up with a, a technique in which they took the distances apart of each of the five outer planets used by astrologers. So that's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. They arrange them in pairs. So each planet is in a pair with every other planet. Um, each uh, pair of planets is in a certain distance apart at any one time. And so if you add up all those distances, you get a figure. And that figure rises and falls uh, like a, a graph. So quite a, an ingenious plan. And Barbeau found in using that, that the high points and the low points seemed to correlate with turning points in planetary tension. And so he then began to use this system. And it was on uh, that basis, as well as the grouping of Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto, that he uh, said that the year 2020 would be a, a turning point because there's a great, uh, a, a very deep trough in his graph uh, at that time. He started a magazine called uh, L'Astrologue, which he uh, edited and uh, published for many years. His focus was, well, uh, here it is. Here's a hypothesis, which actually goes uh, back to in its current form to the classical Greek world? Um, and uh, is it still something we can make use of? So there was always an inquiring, questioning spirit to his work. Does Barbeau's cyclical index offer a reliable scientific methodology for the prediction of pandemics? And if so, why were there so few astrologers who predicted the pandemic? I always avoid the word uh, science uh, because 
it takes us into a culture war. You know, there are huge arguments uh, that take place within an English language framework, actually, over you know, what science is, who can speak for it, what it does. So I'm a historian. I observe that Barbo made a, a remarkable prediction. Now, the reason that uh, astrologers have trouble making predictions uh, or political predictions, we should say, they still use the old system of horoscopes, house systems, uh, uh, zodiac signs, lots and lots and lots of heavy uh, symbolic interpretation and so on and one off events. And it's a muddle. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, the system is uh, completely uh, wrong because then I'd be pronouncing on what is you know, true or false but it's a muddle. There's too much noise. Where the use of horoscopes is effective is on in, in an individual level where you have you know, a client situation and uh, an astrologer uh, making uh, meaning of a client's life using astrological symbolism. And clearly that has a, a wide appeal. The uh, high profile predictions that there would be no uh, war, uh, it, the war which became the Second World War, uh, were based on a very uh, sort of simple, naive astrology of the time, including such statements as uh, Adolf Hitler was born with the sun in uh, Taurus. Uh, the zodiac sign of Taurus is ruled by the planet Venus. Venus is a planet of peace. And therefore, Hitler won't start a war. So there was a, a, a logic there. Uh, there's clearly, you know, a method. You look at the, the horoscope of the leader, you interpret it, and that you extrapolate. But um, the uh, the method was clearly um, completely it completely failed. And I would say that you know, there's a number of reasons it failed. Well, one is because it's just very very naive application of astrology in the first place. Now, whether you think astrology is the greatest thing or, or complete rubbish doesn't matter within its own terms. That's a very naive use of uh, astrology, but also completely out of context and completely decontextualized from any observation of what the Nazis were, were up to. Uh, if you want to seriously uh, look at uh, political events, then ordinary astrology isn't up to the task. In history, going back as an historian, what, what would you say is the most significant prediction made by astrologer? I, I think a very significant prediction uh, was one made by the great astronomer Johannes Kepler in uh, 1618. Astrology was everywhere in Europe in the 13th, 14th, 15th, uh, 16th centuries. Now, what happened in the 16th century was a huge period of upheaval in Europe. Uh, the Reformation caused a, a schism in the Christian world between in Europe, the Protestant North and the Catholic South. So you know, imagine how that felt, you know, one Christian pitted against another. And then the Protestant world fragmented as well. Uh, there was huge threats from the Muslim world, from the Ottoman Empire. And then there were civil wars as a result of the Reformation. So France was torn apart by wars of religion for many decades. So there's an astrologer called Jean Baudin, who's a great philosopher as well. Baudin is regarded as the founder of modern uh, legal and political theory. And uh, he said, look, if astrology can't help us out of this mess, it's completely useless. He said, we've got to abandon uh, the whole notion of astrology as based on you know, horoscopes, house systems, uh, zodiac signs, and so on, and just deal with what we can measure, which is the observed positions of the planets as we look at them from the Earth, using the Earth as the center of the system. Uh, he already knew, by the way, that the sun was the uh, center of the system, but he's looking at it uh, saying, look, we are here on planet Earth, and we look at the sky, so how does it, how's the geometrical system focus on us. So um, he said, what we have to do is look back at previous critical points in history, see what the planetary alignments were and patterns and see how they repeat. Now, Bodan set out that theory. He didn't actually uh, take this forward at all and do any work on this himself, but Johannes Kepler did. 
from Kepler, we remember as the uh, formulator of uh, the series of uh, laws of planetary motion. But he was also very concerned by the upheavals caused by the Reformation in Europe. And he read Bodam, and he adopted this notion that you could uh, abandon the entire fabric of medieval astrology and just look at cyclical repetition. And by the way, he did use uh, traditional astrology in his personal work. He was called uh, on, upon to advise various of the most influential people of the time. But theoretically, he said, look, this, this system clearly cannot help us on a sort of macro uh, scale. So he actually did make sample predictions. And he made one in 1618, where he looked very clearly at uh, the, the series of planetary alignments. Um, and he looked back and he said, well, these look like the planetary alignments which took place during the Peasants' War in 1525, which was a huge uh, rebellion that took place in uh, Germany. Um, the revolt in the Netherlands in 1565, now this might not seem much to us now, but at the time it was a pretty big deal because it was a re revolt by Protestants against the power, the huge hegemonic power of Spain, the representatives of the Catholic world. And then thirdly, an uprising in 1604 in Hungary, which again might not seem like to a big deal to us now, but the, at the time where the uprising took place, was on the border between the uh, Muslim Ottoman Turkish Empire and Christian Europe. It was so that was like the um, the uh, analogous to the Iron Curtain of you know the post-war period in Europe. It, it was it was a border between one culture and another, and so uh, of huge significance. So Kepler looked at that and he said, well. Um, in uh, 1618, uh, there's going to be uh, huge um, uh, uh, upheavals of a similar kind, and he pinpointed May as one significant month. Now, um, <clears throat> on the 23rd of May, 1618, a very particular event happened. We're down, we're down here looking like a butterfly flapping its wings, by the way. Um, there were a couple of... Uh, ambassadors of the Holy Roman Empire. They were in Prague. They were in the, uh, the palace in Prague. And they were, uh, there was a bit of an argument. They were thrown out of the window. But you visited the window where they were thrown out. This is known as the defenestration of Prague. And uh, this single event caused the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War was the Great European War. Pretty much every European country was involved at one time or another. Went on for 30 years. Parts of Germany were devastated. So Kepler actually, we have no record of him looking back at his 1618 prediction and, and saying, well, I got that right. But actually, in terms of his methodology, he did get it right. Astrology, by the way, went through a similar crisis in that uh, produced uh, the work of Bodan and Kepler went through a crisis in the late 15th century when there were high profile predictions of a great flood and great disaster in the 1490s, 1480s and 90s. Now, this didn't happen. And so the astrologers then, or critics of astrology responded in different ways. And there were, there were completely different responses. Um, one group said, astrology is fine as it is, we just carry on. Another group said, well, we need to get rid of what they called Arabic astrology. They didn't have a very clear idea of what that was and go back to a pure classical Greek version. Um, another group actually said that we need to be more uh, spiritual about it. And that, that th those were the, the people that were attracted, say, to uh, Kabbalah. And then along came uh, Bodan and Kepler and said, no, we need to dump the lot and start again on an empirical basis, looking at planetary patterns and looking at their, whether or not they coincide with significant events. If they don't, 
we don't have an astrology. And if they do, we do. And it's astrology of very simple repetition. So would you say astrology is in a similar crisis at the moment in, in 2021? That's a difficult question to answer because, you know, astrology doesn't actually exist as any one thing. There's multiple astrologies, use of the plural, recognises that most ways of looking at the world have uh, very different theories, applications. You know, if, if we look at uh, astrology as it appeals to many people as a sense of psychological explanation or grounding themselves in a themselves in a greater universe, it's clearly flourishing, and it's flourishing via uh, social media, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and so on. Um, and that sort of astrology is just carrying on as it always has done. It's the astrology of, of the, the people in the four, great crisis of the 1490s who said, astrology is fine, let's just carry on. And indeed, most people did just carry on because I think for two reasons. Firstly, most people aren't particularly concerned about sort of huge debates about what's real or what's true or not. And secondly, astrology clearly makes sense. That's an observation we can make. Uh, just looking at the fact it makes sense to an awful lot of people. So in one sense, astrology is uh, flourishing. I, I take uh, a great sort of personal umbrage at, at the way in which um, astrology uh, as a, an ancient way of connecting people with the wider cosmos is, uh, is often ridiculed because it seems to me to be a fundamentally sort of uh, ignorant uh, position to take. Um, so, so there it is. It's a cultural phenomenon. It's there, and lots of people love it. Um, but uh, for me uh, personally, I'm sort of very interested in uh, theories of time and the extent to which the future exists already. And for me, that's where work like Barbos takes me. So. Now, again, if we look back to, if, to, to classical uh, theory of time, to other, you know, to Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, many Islam, many indigenous uh, teachings, we always find that there's a sense that time exists, that in, in, in the future, at least uh, only of some potential. And that's a, not a controversial thing if you say, if you, to say about it. Every, every, you know, person in medieval Europe took this uh, for granted because they'd read the philosopher Aristotle. And there's a great uh, analogy which is used there, not unlike you know, the way in which the butterfly flapping its wings causes a, a hurricane. So the great analogy for the future existing in potential is that an acorn can only become an oak tree. And an acorn cannot become a cat or a tractor. It has to become an oak tree. So, you know, Aristotle looked at this and said, well, clearly the potential for the oak tree is within the acorn. And that seems to me to be pretty obvious and controversial thing to say. But the extrapolation from that then is, in what sense is the potential for anything in the future already present? You know, built into the fabric of society. This, again, is fundamentally the, the position raised by the ancient notion of harmony. But, you know, there, 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 there's a, an ebb and flow that moves through society. And so the potential for the future ebb and flow is already there. So, you know, th these arguments rage about what constitutes in, in individuality. You know, as human beings, are we born as a tabula rasa, a blank slate? From which then we absorb cultural influences, are educated and so on. Or no, or are we born with some innate potential, which is what um, many you know, psychologists, geneticists, and so on think. And you know, the huge amount of evidence leads that way. And that, of course, is the fundamental proposition of natal astrology, the use of astrology uh, to look at individual lives, um, which I think is, um, is part of astrology's appeal for people to say, look, I've, um, I have this potential. So many people go to astrologers uh, to ask uh, 
what's going to happen, but mainly they go along to um, because they've got a present question. It's always to do with the present when people go to see an astrologer. And what the, you know, the astrologer then fundamentally does is to put that person's current question into some sort of context in terms of their, their potential and where they're going. And usually, you know, the choices they can make or how they can self-develop. So in that sense, you know, astrology fascinates me because it is the heir to these ancient theories of time. Um, another theory of time that comes from the classical world outlined by Plato, which is that um, everything moves in a supreme order. And as that, which is, he took as evident from the fact that the planets move in measurable orders as we see them from Earth. And so he had a view that consciousness is prior to matter. So it's not that, you know, our brains produce thoughts, but thoughts exist independently. And so he thought that as the planets move, different ideas emerge in human beings and in, in the human you know, collective. So again, he, he would say, and this is fundamental to his philosophy, that again, as you get these movements of um, harmony, peaks and troughs, then different kinds of ideas, or he, Platonists also use the word archetypes, emerge. And again, this you know, takes us back to Barbo and what's happening with his cyclical graph. It's also fundamentally a you know, platonic construction. Uh, so, <clears throat> the, 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 so you know, and then the, the question always arises, well, you know, how far can we influence the future? The Stoic philosophers from the classical world thought we couldn't influence the future at all. All we could do was, was live as part of this great order and adjust our responses to it. So if something uh, really bad happened, you just had to somehow pass through it. And that's, you know, well, that's what it means to be stoical. But I, I think that we have, to, we have to act as if we can change the future. You know, if we, act, if we act as if we can't change the future, I think that way there's a depression lies and feelings of powerless. But if we act as if we can change the future, then um, I think uh, we can. This, this takes me back to the, you know, the climate crisis and the environmental crisis. You know, uh, and the point of the Harmony Debates book, we can make individual choices. So are there any other significant predictions that André Barbeau made that is worth a mention? Well, yeah, I, I draw attention to uh, two. Uh, the first one was a prediction he made in the 1960s uh, that the years 1979 to 83 brought the risk of a third world war. And again, he set out his logic very clearly. There was a sharp uh, drop in the cyclical planetary index. And so, you know, his extrapolation was, well, you know, global crisis, what could that mean? Obviously, third world war, which was very, in the context of the, the Cold War, uh, very uh, straightforward prediction to make. Now, uh, what happened in those years was that there was no war, but there was a huge fear of war. At the time, that period was known as the Second Cold War because it came after a relaxation in the 1970s when there'd been more conversations between the, uh, the communist bloc and the, the Western world. The period began with two events, uh, 1979. One was the election of President Reagan, who came into office with a much more uh, assertive attitude towards the communist world. And the other was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which then substantiated Western fears that the Soviet Union was in an expansionist mood. And then uh, <clears throat> the what happened uh, after that in terms of the sort of weaponization was that cruise missiles were installed in Europe and you know, cruise missiles with potentially nuclear warheads, tactical nuclear warheads. So a much 
the simpler and easier way, people feared, of starting a nuclear war. And there was huge paranoia of this, I remember it well. And this produced such phenomena as the Greenham Common Peace Camp in, uh, in England, which is where there was the American, uh, one of the American bases where cruise missiles were, were present. Uh, so the war didn't actually take place, but there was fear. It was a sort of you know, stomach gripping fear for many people that resulted in the many you know, waves of demonstrations, the peace movement boomed and so on. So one can go back to that and say, well, it didn't have what Barbo predicted was almost a fear. So if we're looking at the emergence of platonic ideas, Plato might have said, hey, the idea of fear is going to arise. And that's what I think Barbo identified. And then he had another very, very simple prediction. He observed that in <clears throat> Uh, 1917, when the Bolshevik revolution took place in Russia, there was a conjunction of Saturn and Neptune. And then he saw in 1953, when Stalin died, there was a conjunction of Saturn and Neptune. And of course, the death of Stalin produced this sort of epochal change in the, the character of the Soviet Union, its relations with the rest of the world. And within a few years, um, uh, you know, Khrushchev, who began to dismantle the Stalinist machine, the Soviet Union, denounced Stalin publicly. And, and, and you know, it's a sort of shattering event. So Barbo said, well, there's a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in 1989. Uh, what should we expect? Well, he said the collapse of communism. Uh, so, and of course, as we know, 1989 was the, uh, uh, the communist bloc in Eastern Europe collapsed, the Berlin Wall opened in November of that year, and then the ripple effects resulted in the collapse of the communist regime and the, and the Soviet Union. So, you know, a simple methodology and a simple prediction uh, demonstrated uh, the, uh, if you like, the, the, the power of Barbo's predictive technique. So again, you know, I come back to theories of time. What does this Tell us about theories of time. You know, are we uh, living in a present in which the future doesn't exist at all? Are we living in a present in which the future exists in potential, and we can work with it and shape with it, shape it, and act politically, which is what you know, Plato hoped, Kepler thought, and uh, and and so on? Or you know, are we living in a future which is pre? Determined, which is what some you know physicists think. There's a theory called, called it a block time, in which time is envisaged as existing like a, 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 a three-dimensional brick, and all we have to do is move through it. So um, for me, you know, we can't ever know the the truth of where we are, but what work like Barbo's does is make us think about where we exist in relation to time. Tell us about your book, The Harmony Debates. The, the Harmony Debates book was uh, published as a result of several developments in my own university, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. So the university's patron is the Prince of Wales. And in 2010, he published a book called Harmony, A New Way of uh, Living on the Planet, together with two colleagues, Tony Juniper, the environmentalist, and the uh, philosopher and thinker Ian Skelly, and what the three of them did was take the ancient principles of harmony, as found in many cultures, notably classical Greek culture, Taoism, uh, Buddhism, so on, and say, OK, if there is a fundamental harmony in the world in that there is a, a, a fundamental balance and a fundamental order, then how do we live with that? So the question that we look at is how we can work with that order in order to uh, work for a more peaceful world. The, the ancient thinkers took the view that as you reach a, a peak of tension in the harmonious pattern, you should consciously work to moderate that, uh, uh, any, any conflict, 
and so enhance cooperation and collaboration. And in fact, at each end of the, the scale, the troughs, you would do that as well. Well, what was the biggest takeaway from the Harmony debates for you, Nick? I think the biggest takeaway from the book is that we can uh, restore a world in which the choices we make and the policies that are implemented take into account the greatest uh, possible welfare, both of people and planet. And so planet includes the entire ecological system and environment, and of course, within which people live. So there's a measure of uh, self-interest because we want to survive, but there's also an understanding that uh, we won't be around forever, even that our planet won't be around forever. And so there, so the, the welfare of the greater system has to be understood. If you appreciate this video, like, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Comment below if this video has inspired you to take a more serious look at astrology and let us know who you'd like to be interviewed on the research series.